Uh, I do bring you greetings from Tim and Chanel Jones over in uh, Portland, Maine. Me and Shiloh had a great time. Something really amazing happened to me over there. I had homegrown oysters. That was a thing that Tim's landlord had grows oysters behind his house. Most amazing things in the world. And it was great to be there. Great. We, we spoke on Wednesday night to the church there in Portland. And, uh, you know, one of the things I love about our family of churches is that it, it's always like together. Like you always feel like I, we have so much in common. Like we we know the same thing. We, we believe people have to uh, repent. We believe people have to be baptized. We believe we have to be here on Wednesday night <laughs> together mm -hmm. to worship and, um, and just be devoted to one another. It's the same all over our family of churches. This morning, I'm going to speak primarily from Ruth chapter one. Uh, Ruth chapter one. That's right. For the ladies out there, we want to pay attention to Ruth. What a great example of this idea of devotion. Devotion. You know, most places that people are in life, they've only ever known any kind of devotion in family. But family can be a strange thing. Uh, there was an attorney who gathered an entire family together to read a will for this gentleman. And relatives came from, from all around to see if they were included in the inheritance of this gentleman who died. And the lawyer opened the will and, uh, and, and befitting the occasion, somberly began to read. To my cousin Ed, I leave my ranch. <laughs> to my brother Jim, I leave my money market accounts. Mm -hmm. To my neighbor and good friend Fred, I leave my stocks. And finally, to my cousin George, who always sat around and never did anything, but wanted to be remembered in my will, I leave my greeting. Hi, George. <laughs> Most families have some unusual yes. things like that that can happen. Uh, your family, whether you know it or not, or, or believe it or want to take hold of it or not, has had an incredible impact in your life. Sometimes for good. Sometimes for not so good. Why? Because there are no perfect people. There can be no perfect families. But families can be very, very good. As I, as I get older, I'm more and more grateful for my family. You know, it was a year ago today that my father died. And growing up, I was not as grateful as I could have been. But when I realized that uh, my dad was adopted and made to work on the farm and made to quit school in the eighth grade, no high school education, but he kept our family together and loved us. His steadfastness kept us there. He, he loved to laugh. He was super affectionate. If you, if you ask my wife, one of the things she loves about my parenting, it's that I, I never cease to give my sons kisses. Very affectionate. I learned that from my dad. Family is super important to us. You ever notice how in your family, you can have inside jokes with your family, but if someone from outside your family hears it and starts to make fun of your brother or your sister, you're, you, you're like, wait, you can't say that. <laughs> I, that's my brother. I can say that. But things get a little bit rougher. And, and family, you know, you got cousins, you protect them, but your immediate family is always first. And then cousins and everybody else can fend for themselves. This is my family. <laughs> we will react quickly to defend our family. Why? Because we are devoted to them. As you heard, there's, there's something about uh, thickness of blood and water, right? Blood is thicker than water. So family, we stay devoted. And so today we want to talk about devotion as the family of God. And, and how do we get there? And we're going to talk about it from Ruth chapter one. Amen. In the scriptures, God used a couple of uh, immediate analogies you can think of for the church. One is the human body. That's 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12 and Ephesians Four. But another important analogy is the church to family. The family analogy gives us a greater appreciation for how the church is meant to, meant to function and meant to be together. It's supposed to be like family. And this idea of family is meant to add a sense of warmth and tenderness and concern and loyalty that the body kind of lacks. We can understand parts of the body and how if I woke up tomorrow and my pinky finger was gone, I would know it and I'd feel like be looking for my pinky finger. Where'd that go overnight? Wow. <laughs> but family, if I woke up tomorrow and my dad wasn't here, wow. 
I woke up tomorrow and my mom wasn't there. The family analogy adds a sense of human emotion and, and devotion to our understanding of the church that we really need to grasp. Paul said in Romans 12, 10, we are going to be in Ruth 1. But in Romans 12, 10, Paul said, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. This word uh, brotherly love in, in Greek is Philadelphia. That's where you get the city of brotherly love. And it refers to the love that should exist between the closest uh, of friends. Just, just a decision to love. We have a friend named Renee Hamilton. and She had a sign that said, uh, friends are, are the family that you choose. It's a decision. When we apply it to the church, it refers to love that disciples of Jesus are supposed to have for each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. A close, dedicated love. Philadelphia. We are the family of God. It tells us. Paul wrote uh, in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14, For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom the whole family of believers in heaven and on earth derives its name. You know, often in the Bible, if you have some older translations, people read different translations of the Bible, the King James or, or the NIV. Now it's kind of getting to be like NIV. I don't do the new NIV, just the old NIV. But you read these translations of the Bible in the term a brother or brothers is used to talk about the family of God often in the New Testament. Right. The update in NIV says brothers and sisters makes the women feel a bit more included, and that's all right. And it's it's correct. Mm -hmm. It's grammatically correct from Greek. The word brothers literally means from the same womb. The Greek word is adelphos. It means from the same womb. We we come from the same parentage, from the same line. And so when it talks about disciples being brothers, it means fellow believers, members of God's family, brothers and sisters in Christ. It, it means we've been all been, we've all been born again into God's forever family. That's something I thought about on the way home. People talk about forever homes for pets and forever. There's only one forever. There's eternity with God forever. We're God's forever family. We're related, related through a different common heritage. In Ephesians 1, 5, it says, in love, he predestined us to be adopted to sonship through Jesus Christ. We were adopted. But the term brotherly love isn't the only aspect of this verse here. To be devoted to one another in brotherly love that has this family connotation. The phrase be devoted is translated from, uh, from a Greek word called philostorgos. And storgos uh, is the word for mutual love of parents and children. So it's familial love and also husbands and wives. And so this idea of devotion could be Showing loving affection, loving tenderly. That's why if you looked in the King James Version, sometimes when I do my sermon, I look at different versions because there's different translations. The King James Version, Romans chapter 12 and verse 10 says, be kindly affectioned to one another with brotherly love. It's this emotional connection that you find in family who you have through people who weren't your family, but now are. We're not from the same physical womb but we are connected by blood you know some of you may have uh, been familiar with the term blood brother when you were younger maybe you did some of those things like i did when i was younger you're going to be my blood brother and you would cut yourself somewhere and your other friend would cut themselves and put them together now we're we're related now the same blood flows in both of our veins i'm sorry if i gave anyone ideas i'm really sorry about that. <laughs> that's the kind of stuff we did growing up maybe you've heard that term but disciples are blood brothers and sisters. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. We're all forgiven of our sons because of the blood of Jesus. And so the thing that connects us as disciples is the blood of Jesus. We're God's family brought together through the blood of Christ. And because we are God's family, we must be devoted to one another with brotherly love. We must be kindly affectioned to one another with brotherly love. How can we be devoted to one another? And that's where we come to Ruth chapter 1. In my devotions, I recently read the book of Ruth. And it's so good. It talks about Ruth and Naomi. It's a great narrative and history there. It's a time of famine. 
uh, just a little bit. If you don't know about the book of Ruth, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but uh, it's a time of famine. And uh, there's a Jewish man from Bethlehem uh, who's married to a woman named Naomi. And Elimelech is his name. And Naomi, they leave Israel and they go and their sons marry two women from a country called Moab. And after they've left and their sons are married to these women from Moab, Elimelech dies uh, soon after they get there. Naomi's sons have married these Moabite women. Uh, Ruth is one of these Moabite women. And after they've been there 10 years, the mom with the sons and the daughters-in-law being taken care of, after they've been there 10 years, both of the sons die. There's no social security. Uh, there's no welfare. Uh, and Ruth is, a, uh, Ruth is a Moabite, but the mom is a Jew from a place she doesn't have any family there. Her sons are gone. No one makes any money. It's a desperate time. But it's been 10 years and the famine has ended. So Naomi is going to go back to Jerusalem, back to Bethlehem. And she had uh, no reason to stay there in Moab. So she told her daughters-in-law this. She said to Ruth and to Orpah, I love them. There's some books in the Bible that I just love Orpah. But uh, there's some books in the Bible I just love those. But Ruth chapter 1 and verse 8 and 9 says, uh, Naomi says to her daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. You need to be taken care of. May the Lord show kindness to you as you've shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. I can't take care of you. I'm going somewhere that I can't take care of myself for you. Go be taken care of. Then the Bible says here that uh, she kissed them and they wept aloud. And they said to her in Ruth chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, we'll go back with you to your people. So both the daughters say, no, no, we're going we're gonna to stay with you. you. You've become like our mother. And so Naomi says, return home, my daughters. Why, why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons? Who could become your husbands? You're going to a place where, you know, they're going back to Israel and they're not supposed to marry foreign women. Who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons tomorrow, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. This is a woman who's hopeless and saying, I don't want you to go with me in my pain and go through this challenging time. And in chapter, in chapter 1, verse 14, it says that this, they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Orpah made the logical decision. What you've said is a lot of wisdom. I'll go with you. Okay, then I'm out. So, right. Uh, she made the, I'm going to be committed. But when she had the second way out, she took it. Orpah left. But Ruth clung to her. Naomi said to Ruth, look, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. So that's the third time there for Ruth. And this is Ruth's response. It's kind of well known. In chapter one, verse 16, it says, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. And how does Naomi respond to this, to this devotion that's not required and not necessary and freely given? In verse 18, it says, when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Okay, you've worn me down. If you want to suffer, that's up to you. Come with me. Ruth's commitment to Naomi is the perfect example of being devoted to one another. Ruth did not have to make that decision. It was costly for her. Like she had no idea where, where are we going to live? What are we going to do? How are we going to live? How long are we going to live? She said, I'll, I'll go where you die. I'll die. I'd be thinking that's not going to take very long. At this time in history, mm -hmm. she was headed to a, a foreign land. So it wasn't like we're just in Moab and we're suffering here. It's like, okay, so we don't have anything and you don't have anybody there, but we're going to leave and go back to Israel. No rights in Israel for a Moabite woman. 
very low probability of her ever getting married. But Ruth chose to devote herself to her mother-in-law. And if you're not aware of the rest of the story, this is kind of the cleft notes of how it ends. She eventually uh, marries a man named Boaz, one of her former father-in-law's relatives. She marries Boaz, who's a very wealthy man. So not only is she married, but she marries a wealthy man. And they would have a son whose name was Obed, who would be the father of a man named Jesse, who would be the father of King David, Israel's second king. This is the legacy of devotion from Ruth. How blessed is someone who is devoted out of free will? But none of that would have happened if Ruth had not made the decision to devote herself to her mother-in-law. So how can we develop that kind of devoted, affectionate, familial love for one another as the body of Christ? I think there's three lessons here of how we can be devoted to one another. The first one is this. Uh, let me suggest that being devoted begins with a decision. With a decision. You know, most of us, when we studied the Bible and we said we agree that the Bible is the word of God and we're going to obey it. And this is what sin is. and I'm going to stay away from it. Uh, and we looked at the cross and said, what did we what, what have we done here? What happened to Jesus? We looked at uh, we looked at repentance maybe after that. And repentance is first and foremost a decision. I'm going to turn away from sin and I'm going to turn to God. But the first thing we do is decide. It's the same way with devotion. You could say it's a matter of repentance being devoted to one another. Before we become disciples, we are devoted to ourselves. When we grew up in our family, we went through a time when we were younger, we just loved mom and dad and they could do no wrong. And then we became teenagers and we kind of just had to live there because that's who paid the bills and fed us food. We didn't have the same devotion. We wanted to go off and do things on our own and be on our own. I want to be with my friends. Why can't I be with my friends? That's how we work. We, we are two-year-olds that are selfish. We are teenagers that are selfish. That is part of us. Our sinful nature is to be selfish and to make decisions for us. So isn't it logical that to be devoted to others, it takes a decision to be devoted to others? It's got to be your personal decision to be devoted to others. The Bible says this in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. What do we find here? How devoted is God to us that he would send his son and not just send his son, but send his son as a sacrifice for our sins. How devoted is Jesus to us, who not only left heaven, but died a horrible death so that our sins could be forgiven. That is our example of devotion, to be imitators of God. And each person who calls themselves a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Christ, is called to be devoted to someone, not themselves, because that's who our God was, devoted to a people who are not gods. Instead, we're rebellious to God. Instead, in Ephesians 2 says, we were objects of wrath because of our sin. So it starts with a decision to be devoted to one another in brotherly love. You know, even in a church of about 40 people here, Zoom online, that can be an overwhelming decision. And so in our churches, many of our churches, we have family groups. Just, just being devoted to six or seven people can be challenging enough. Think about your own family. Just being devoted to your own physical family can be challenging enough. I'll tell you, since I lost my dad, keeping my brother and sister connection and cousin it's like i'm calling every week it's hard when you lose your parents like what what kept us together what was them and you have no grandparents and there's just no structure who's going to decide to be the structure that's the way it is in the church right when we have Jesus with us, but I appreciated so much Jeremiah's talk, but Jesus is with us spiritually through the Holy Spirit. 
We have to make decisions to follow the things that he says that we should do. We have to make a phone call to Jesus every day and read our Bibles and pray. We got to make that decision to stay connected. And it's exactly the same with our brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't think we should even try to be connected to every disciple. Because we have an extended family. If you're in a family group, though, man, we need to stay connected. We need to call one another. Now, different from our physical families, sometimes our family groups shuffle depending on needs and changes. And so it's an ever-changing decision. I was sharing with David last week that Jesus sacrificed and he gave, but he only got on the cross once. As disciples of Jesus, we, we have to sacrifice and change until the day that we die. So we want to be careful. We don't try to change family groups all the time, but there are those changes. And in those changes, we have to still make decisions to make these people family. They're already cousins. Now they're cousins who have moved in with us. Our family shuffled just a little bit. The second thing to develop devotion is determination. We have to make a decision. Have you made that decision in your heart that I'm going to be devoted to others? But then we have to have determination. we got to stick with it and follow through. If we've made the decision and, and we continue with determination, then God will supply us with the energy that we need and the energy for devoted love. That's why it says in Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. God will take care. Keep going. At the proper time, you'll reach a harvest of good. I always think, what is the proper time? When I learn to get over my selfishness and give to others, when I make that decision, when I'm determined and I figure out what God's trying to change in my life, I'm going to figure out, wow, that is the thing I need to change. Thank you so much, God. It's difficult to make the decision to be devoted. But if you are determined, there's a harvest of righteousness. There's a harvest of righteousness. And lastly, when you make that decision and you're determined, the result will be a demonstration. Being devoted to one another in brother love is seen in demonstrations from one to each other. Uh, first of all, it's a decision to be to be present. You know, we haven't had family group meetings for a while since the pandemic. And we're, we're shuffling stuff and figuring out how to meet together. But family group meetings are coming up. Making a decision like, hey, bro, I can meet this day. And you, you put that in a calendar and you say, I'm going to go. And then you go. Uh, one of the things that we can do to be present is just take a look once in a while at the church calendar. Make sure you know what's going on. When are we going to be downtown serving the homeless? Are there people in my family group going? Let's ride together. Let's be as connected as possible. There's a, a demonstration of devotion that comes from that decision and determination. It is hard to love from a distance. It's hard to love from a distance. If you make decisions not to be where brothers and sisters are, you're making the decision not to love as much as you can love. Uh, no, I'm not saying that you're always going to be at everything all the time. But when you make a decision not to, that's a hardening of your heart. That's a hardening of your heart. And we have to be very careful with our hearts. If we're devoted to the church family, then we'll be where, there when the family gathers. You know, like I said, we all have different kind of families. But in my family, Growing up, if I wasn't at the dinner table, if one of the kids is not at the dinner table, there's going to be copious amounts of yelling outside. Where are you? What's going on? And if they don't get you and they eat dinner, I, did, I didn't grow up in the, I didn't get timeouts growing up. There's, there were belts and I'm from the South. There were switches involved. I guess that's what my dad, when he would spank me, say, I'm doing this because I love you, son. <laughs> but I knew that being part of the family, being together was very important. And if I wasn't there, I knew I was missed. Sometimes I was missed a lot. <laughs> Family's important. Family's important. We need to be together. No one here is going to get whipped, first of all. Let me make sure that analogy doesn't <laughs> bleed over into anything. It doesn't make sense to say that we have the heart of Jesus as disciples, that we're going to be devoted 
but then not show up at times when there's fellowship. Just doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. You know, I, I was sharing earlier, like I love, I love through the pandemic that we could do Zoom, and I love now that we have Zoom, and I appreciate everybody being on Zoom. One of my concerns is it's going to get so easy to be at home and not to connect with people in person that we're going to miss some of that devotion and that love. And even, even if you're on Zoom, are you present? You know, this would always be the big thing on Zoom, like all the screens are blacked out. What are you watching? Like, are people listening and pay attention and, and involved here? That, that's part of being present on Zoom is my face is there. I'm smiling at you. If you are on Zoom, are you making yourself known to, uh, to someone in your family group? Do people know you're not here? You're on Zoom. Man, Johnny's sick or, or mom can't do this or the car is broken down. By the way, if it was my brother or sister and the car was broken down, they would never cease to call me. Hey, can you come pick me up because I want to go to dinner? With the family. Reach out. That's what family does, even when there's hardship. But first of all, be present. Second demonstration is being attentive. Being attentive. You know, this is one of the things that I find is more difficult for men than women, but it's difficult for everyone. But being attentive, watching, uh, listening, considering the needs of others, paying attention to other people. Man, if it's hard just to be together, how much more difficult is it for us to be present emotionally for brothers and sisters? A lot of times when there's been issues in family, that's where the issue was. Mom and dad stayed together, but no one was emotionally, everyone was overwhelmed. Or dad just didn't talk. He did what his dad did. Or, or mom or dad drank or there were drugs. Emotional unavailability is sometimes just as confusing as nobody being there. But I, but I think parents are supposed to love me and talk to me and be concerned about my scraped knees and scraped elbows. Be attentive. Pay attention to other people. What are they saying? How are they acting? What, what are they needing? Think about if you were in their situation, put yourself in their shoes. What, what would I need right now if I was going through this challenging time? Be available. You know, I... I I'm on Facebook. I follow this Facebook page with disciples. And um, last year when there was so much going on racially, uh, brothers and sisters of color were feeling some things. And I didn't know what they were feeling, and I certainly didn't know how to fix it. But I, I just told a couple people I love, man, I love you. I'm going to pray together. I don't know what to do here. I'm so sorry you're going through this. Because I don't know what people are going through or what. Did I fix anything or make a political statement? No. I just saw people were hurting, and I was attentive. I'm not great. I didn't talk to enough people. I mean, didn't say the right thing. Being attentive doesn't mean you're going to do everything right all the time. But if you just demonstrate that you're paying attention to how someone's feeling and what they're needing, they'll feel like, man, that person is my friend. They have no idea what they've talked about, but I know they love me. They said something. They did <laughs> They did something. They reached out. Just act on it. Act on it. Why? Because the third thing is communication leads to community. If you're going to demonstrate love for people, you, you got to act. You have to actually do something or say something. Love is not a feeling, right? If a husband uh, never talks to his wife or serves his wife or, or takes up his wife's interests, she would say, my husband loves me, but does she feel my husband loves me? We all love each other, right? But, but do we say we love each other or do we act on that? Communi uh, communication leads to community. You, you got to respond somehow. There's no such thing as devotion if you're just going to be silent all the time. You can be wrong, but you can't be quiet. And that's funny how that works. Because I don't know about your family. But in my family, we hurt each other and we loved each other. That is the family of Christ. We'll talk about that in just a minute. You got to share your words, your, your uh, experiences, your affection. You got to share those things. That, that is part of 
uh, being devoted. That is part of the definition of devotion, kindly affection. But ultimately, the issue is being devoted to the fellowship has got to be all about we and a whole lot less about me. I'm wrapping up here. If you're going to experience family life to the full, then we have to pay attention to our devotion to one another. For some of us, that's going to be easier than others. We love to get on the phone. We love to talk to people. We love to meet up and have a cup of coffee. We love to go out. Some of us, maybe you don't. But it doesn't matter if it's easy or hard for you. The Bible doesn't change for you because things are hard. The Bible is the Bible. If we want to please God, we have to make the decision, act with determination, and be consistent with demonstration. That means for each of us, we have to overcome our obstacles, whether it's internal or external. You know, some people during COVID just didn't call anybody or talk to anybody and just assume nobody loved them, even as they were busy not loving anybody else. Are you a, are you a phone call person, not text? I, I'm, I'm just going to say right now, text is bad. If I get a text longer than three lines, a communication problem is about to take place because I don't understand what you're talking about. We're not all good writers. And even if we are good writers, we're not good texters. Phone call. Phone call. Especially if it's something important. Text is for time, date, location. I love you. You're awesome. That's about as far as these things need to go. Amen. <laughs> Let me ask you, though. Do you find it difficult to express emotion towards others? If devotion is kindly affectionate, are you affectionate? Do you express, is it hard to express emotions? Is it hard for you to just be in close relationships with other people? Why is that? We all have reasons. There's, and there's often good reasons. And a lot of those reasons go back to our, our family at home. But the Bible doesn't change because you had a bad family life. The Bible changes you because he wants, God wants you to be in his family. When you understand what your struggle is, do you get help with it? Or are you just going to have a log jam of emotion? Or if you've ever seen the movie, uh, Disney movie Tarzan, emotional constipation is what some of us have. I've heard it called that. Some people struggle with interpersonal relationships. I, I do this because I always think someone really likes me until they don't. This fear of rejection that the other shoe is going to drop. They say, they say they think I'm awesome, but what are they? You know, you can get in somebody else's head and figure out what they really think about you. And then that person doesn't like me at all. They never said that. <laughs> you got all the way there by yourself. Fear of rejection. Poor family relationships growing up. That's a real thing. That's a huge thing. Ne negative experiences in your life sometimes leave people feeling angry and, and resentful. And, and that can get in the way of having. Healthy relationships in the present. I don't know where your struggle with kindly affection in family love is. But they can really damage not only your relationships in the church, but many relations, relationships in the church. When we're thinking about ourselves and what we think and how we're sure we're right, we ruin chances to have good relationships with people. You do not know someone's thinking. You do not know someone's motivation. Even if you think it's a wrong motivation or a wrong thinking, you should ask, are you thinking this? What you usually will get is an apology. No, I'm so sorry. What made you think I was thinking that? Well, you looked at me and there was side eye and didn't say anything <laughs> after that. Uh, there was only one sandwich left at the fellowship and you ate it. And so I just was thinking you didn't care about me. <laughs> Maybe I'm the only person that ever gets in my own head. <laughs> I don't know. It's so important for us to read our Bibles because we have to allow God to do his good work in us so that God then does his good work through us for others. Relationships are hard. Even in the church, relationships are hard. Think about your own family. You've hurt people and you've been hurt. In the church, you've hurt people and you've been hurt. But that's still family. You work through it. The truth is, love, even when you're married, maybe especially when you're married, <laughs> love is messy. Brotherly love is messy. Being devoted to others in brotherly love is messy and it's risky. But I guarantee you, 
just as God's love for us was worth the risk for me and you and millions of others. And really all of humanity who have had an opportunity for forever homes with God in eternity. Being devoted is absolutely worth the risk. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for um, such a powerful example of devotion uh, there in the book of Ruth. Thank you for noting that devotion takes hardship. God, Ruth and, and Naomi had to go back and have nothing, and Ruth had to, uh, had to work hard and humble herself and, and, and just have the gleanings, the leftovers. It's, a, it's an inspiring book. And yet even more inspiring than Ruth is the offspring of Boaz and Ruth and Obed and Jesse and David. We see the example of Jesus and his devotion to us. Really, the last full measure of devotion. Giving not just his life, but giving his perfect life as a sacrifice for us. Father, help us who are imperfect strive to be more and more perfect, especially in our devotion to one another. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen.